<clears throat> okay, uh, welcome back everyone. Um, I'm very excited to introduce and say a little bit to start this symposia. Um, we've been following the speakers in this symposia um, for quite a while in trying to think about how their work may influence directions that Taxon Works takes. Nikki asked about priorities and what we do. And um, sometimes the things that we prioritize are just the things that really inspire us. Um, so in the first three talks, you sort of heard a perspective or gathered that the perspective was um, processing data that had already been published. And, and Manuel very much uh, sort of identified that there's this kind of two different paradigms, capturing the past or capturing the, the future and um, or the present or new, new, new species concepts, new ideas. And so this symposia will focus on that process and um, some of the new methods that may um, affect that. So I want to start off with just four or five quick slides to sort of inspire us and to sort of get us thinking about um, the, the bigger picture here. Debbie pointed out that this is sort of the world of the taxonomist and uh, Dimitri and I and others that we've worked with influenced our um, development of tools like TaxonWorks and its precursors. Uh, when we started as taxonomists, we knew that if we wanted to do this as a career, we needed tools that would help us all along the way, that would integrate these kind of physical worlds that you see before you right now. And of course, our worlds now um, with sequences and robots and uh, AI are sort of just bigger workbenches that we still want to integrate and think about. So I want to make a couple observations about um, sort of the scale and the nature of things that we're talking about some of the problems that you're going to hear about in the in the next couple of talks um, and the scale of these problems make it difficult to think about tackling these problems in something like excel excel might be a piece of your workflow but maybe it can't really help us um, overall in the long term so we can think about um, describing in a couple of different studies maybe one species right we still do do that today we might describe 10 species we might even describe 100 species jim talks had papers that they're processing with 300 species and really, we were thinking about tax in taxon works, trying to think about how can we facilitate studies up to 10,000 species, for example, where we're actively curating concepts from many different places. The other axis is that we have data. And so if we think about instead of studies, we look at species on the right side there, we can have species with one data point, right? We can all imagine that 1903 uh, Kiefer, who was a monk, publication where he said uh, the wasp is brown with a red head right that's two data points really this is not so helpful um, or we can imagine our genomics descriptions where we have 10,000 or hundreds of thousands of data points for a single species down the bottom and really we have some sort of distribution between these we have some species with lots of data we have some curve of, of species where there's lots of species but they only have a little bit of data there's maybe one or two species that have tons and tons of data. So how does this all link together and how could we integrate this all um, in a big sort of single platform? One of the things that we try to do with TaxonWorks is think about things. So we model not rows of data or spreadsheets, but we actually model, model sort of nodes in this uh, graph. And um, if I jump into TaxonWorks, I'm looking at one species here that uh, this is a spotted lanternfly and I'm looking at a graph of data and I can come down and I can see things like the people that were involved and their orchid identifiers. I can come over and see in parts of this graph, I can see these purple boxes are nomenclature. Um, I can find references to collecting events, nodes that are, could be further expanded, taxon concepts in the middle of these triangles, um, and sort of a rich graph. And this is before even the observations and the sequence data might be added to the gap. But nevertheless, this is, you can think of this as the vouchering that might be needed to create a fully integrated view, um, a fully sort of networked view of all of the data that we're doing. And again, one of our challenges then is to take that network of data that's related in very sparse sort of ways in some ways, and then produce a rendering that's human re humanly visible. And so here's that spot and lantern fly data that is all graph representative. And here you can see all of that in taxon pages. You can see all of the raw digital data that's behind it. So one of the things we're thinking about is how do we take these perspectives that you're gonna hear about and plug them into this graph? So to close, just a couple of questions that might help you think about the next talks. What are the things that need to be digitally managed in the talks that follow? 
right? Is it a sequence? Is it a PCR reaction? Is it an extract? What are the interfaces that might facilitate the required human computer interactions involved in managing those things, right? We interact with computers through screens, through buttons, through forms. Those are real challenges that we like to think about. At what point in the process of these approaches would it make sense to engage taxonomics? Where, where, where can we help out? Where are we not a, um, a possible solution? And then I'll leave you with a bit of a riddle at the end. What is the name of the thing that is not yet named? What is that thing in your application, right? So as we describe new species, as we look for dark taxa, we're doing that, uh, we need to have some entity that has no name. And what is that in your database system? So with that, um, we're going to pass it on to our first speaker, who I believe is Emily, who's going to talk about um, her paper. It was a wonderful paper that came out in CISBio just recently on uh, large-scale integrative taxonomy, LIT. And I will stop sharing my screen. Take it away, Emily. Okay, thank you, Matt. And I'm just going to put my email in the chat here in case anyone would like that. And... Is that okay? Uh, you got it. Okay. There you Perfect. Go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. So yes, I'm here to present on large scale integrative taxonomy. Um, I was excited when uh, Matt and Deborah approached me about giving this talk, and sort of giving uh, a background of of what large scale integrative taxonomy is. Uh, um, and as they said, it was a, a paper published last year in CISBio. Uh, but also how looking forward this might or something similar might be integrated into a system like TaxonWorks. Uh, so this is specifically developed for dark taxa. So first, maybe I need to define dark taxa. So dark taxa are hyperdiverse and abundant groups of small invertebrates that are poorly known. And in this paper, we actually quantified that. So we said that in order to be considered a dark taxon by our definition, they needed to be fewer than 10% of species described, but more than a thousand species estimated to be out there. So large groups. And these are important because they offer a quantitative approach to biodiversity. So lots of species, lots of specimens, and with all those species and specimens, they do contribute to biomass, even though most of them are very small. The problem is, is to study dark taxa, you have to go through many incredibly large samples. So some of you uh, may be familiar with things, uh, you may work on groups that are similar, and you may be familiar with things like malaise trap samples, which are pictured here. So we have lots of specimens, lots of species, and in these jars, most of them are common. So the bulk of the jar is usually made up of common species. So the question is, how do we sort these? How do we find the new species? How do we find the rare species? Or how do we simply count species or individuals? So we have to be able to do this quickly, efficiently, and accurately because we have these very large samples. So how do we get to the, the species level or the specimen level as fast as we can, but also doing this accurately? The best way to do this is to use multiple data sources. But when you're collecting multiple data sources, you are collecting more data than you would with a single data source. But we're also trying to speed up the taxonomic process. So this was the problem that we were trying to, to figure out. How do we get more data, but do it faster and do it better? So we started with 18,000 flies. That was the project. I work on forid flies. And they clustered into 315 putative species. And this was based on CO1 barcodes. And I'm leaving out some of the details of this, but you can, you can read the paper if you're interested. So many of these clusters, these are just haplotype networks um, done of all 315 clusters. And many of them are species. Many of those clusters equal species. But we really have to look at where they do not. So we have to determine what predicts cluster failure. So which of these clusters are likely to not be species? Which of the clusters are likely to contain multiple species or perhaps only contain part of a species and the others are in another cluster? And in order to do this, what specimens do we have to examine? So the first thing we did is we examined 100 clusters. And here we looked, uh, we looked at the main haplotypes. So where were most of the specimens? 
in the in the cluster. We also looked across the cluster. So if there were any outliers, we wanted to look at the spread of variation. And in this first step, we also looked across uh, geographic zones. So these different colors here represent different geographic zones. So we really wanted to be very thorough in this first step and examine a cluster, lots of specimens sometimes within a cluster to determine, was it a single species? Was it multiple species? In the end, we determined that two factors predict cluster failure, and these are instability and maximum p-distance. So instability is uh, if a cluster at a lower threshold will split, essentially. So we used, and I don't, I don't want to get into the specifics of the clustering, but we used a particular threshold. And if we lower that threshold and the cluster splits into two clusters, then we would consider it unstable. It would have an instability of less than one. And then maximum p distance is simply the maximum distance between any two specimens in the cluster. So looking at these two factors, we could actually say that we can predict failure. So we could label clusters as potentially incongruent if they had an instability less than one and or a max p distance of greater than 1.5. So the next step, we tested this. So we said, okay, we're going to flag a bunch of clusters, 43 PI clusters, in this next part of the data set, and we had 26% failure, failure meaning that there were multiple species within a cluster. We then took the 43 largest non-PI clusters that weren't flagged and we tested those and zero of them failed. They were all valid species. So this means that we can predict the clusters that need additional attention. Now, overall for the data set, we had about 18,000 specimens, as I said, originally 315 clusters, 5.7% of these clusters failed. And that actually sounds, I don't know, it sounds pretty good, right? Like that's an A, but those 5.7% of clusters contain 19% of species and 41% of specimens. So what we can see here is that if we only used those delimitations from the beginning that were based on the CO1 barcodes and we didn't use another data source to validate the clusters and to, to alter our species boundaries, we would actually be misidentifying up to 41% of the specimens. So now that we have validated integrative species concepts, the question is, can we simply fix the initial delimitation? Maybe we can just do something with the initial delimitation and solve the problem and not have to go through all of this. Um, this is the match ratio with morphology. So morphology is the bar to the left, or I'm sorry, PTP. <laughs> this is a match ratio, I'm thinking of a different graph. This is a match ratio with morphology. So PTP, um, if you're familiar with clustering algorithms, ABGD and then objective clustering, which is what we used, are the three algorithms and all the different thresholds shown here. You don't need to know which bar is which. The point of this slide is that nothing is going above 90%. So no one's getting an A. So no matter what we do, no matter what threshold we use, no matter what method we use, we're not getting an A when we compare this to the validated results with morphology. So then the question is, well, could we just do a different method again? The same areas tend to be incongruent across methods. Nobody is getting an A, and this is a known limitation. So here we actually looked, in addition to the other methods that we could cluster our entire data set with, we looked at uh, bold and we looked at bins. So this was a particularly complex cluster here. One cluster ended up being 25 species. And so we said, okay, well, how many of these actually have um, specimens that are contained within bin concepts on bold? And these were the results. And as you can see, these are color coded by bins. So bold isn't getting it right either. So no matter what method we use, no matter what threshold we use, there's confusion. And this is, this is perfectly reasonable because sometimes we have areas where there is very rapid evolution and species are separated sometimes by only a single barcode. So it's impossible to get right with an algorithm. So the result is that integrative taxonomy is a necessity. We have to be using multiple data sources to help validate each other but it can be efficient and expensive and systematic. So here's a little breakdown of, of sort of the lit system generally. So we have a first data source that we use for clustering and flagging. So we cluster the species, the cluster, the barcodes, or we can use a different data source. We cluster into putative species, and then we use that data source to flag which clusters are potentially problematic, potentially incongruent. And we do this for all specimens in a data set. So this has to be really easy and inexpensive to obtain this data source because it's for all specimens and sometimes these data sets are very, very large. And then the second data source is used for validation of the clusters. So this is only select specimens. And because of this, it can be harder or more expensive to obtain. And then once we validate, we either get a validated species 
or we get something that needs more work. So maybe we need to go in and we need to make adjustments. We need to take a, a putative species and split it into two or more species. Sometimes we need to combine it with another cluster because that cluster represents the same species. So in practice, what does this look like? So if you have a cluster, and I've got this window in the way. If you have a cluster, then you can either have it flagged as PI or it's a non-PI cluster. And depending on it, whether or not it's flagged as PI, you examine a different number of specimens. So here, PI, we would examine all main haplotypes, which is up to five or 10 specimens, depending on if you define a main haplotype as being 10% or 20% of the specimens in the cluster. And then you'd examine a distant pair. You want to see the, the reach of the variation of the cluster. And then in non-PI, you simply want to assess the reach of variation. So you use two specimens, make sure it's not contamination, make sure that those are the same species. So in practice, if this was a PI cluster, you would examine seven specimens and it would be very clear where you would have to pick those seven specimens from. And if it was non-PI, you would examine two and it would also be very clear where you get those specimens. So then my question was, and, and what Matt and Deborah and I discussed um, in a meeting a bit ago, was what would it look like if LIT was implemented in taxon work? So I just sort of brainstormed a little and put my thoughts here. So I think if you had your data sets imported into taxon works, the first thing that you would do is you would pick a data set. So maybe you would want to include everything you had. Maybe you'd want something from a particular geographic region or a particular project but you would pick your data set. And then with that, you'd be able to cluster and you'd have different options for clustering, different thresholds that you could use. You could, you could customize your clustering to work with your data. So you would cluster with a first data source. And again, this can be barcodes, um, but eventually as, as Rudolph will talk about in a couple talks, uh, we may not be using barcodes for the first data source. It may be much cheaper and easier to obtain a different data source as your first data source. And then the system would then flag PI clusters. So the system would automatically be set up to tell you which clusters were PI, which were not. And then you could go in and you could validate with a second and perhaps even third data source using specimens indicated by the system. Or it may even be done automatically because, for instance, if you were using barcodes and nuclear markers, they may already be uploaded in the system. So you could say use barcodes as the first data source, use the nuclear markers as the second, and it would give you whether or not species were validated automatically. You wouldn't have to go back in and look at specimens yourself. Of course, if you were using morphology, it could tell you what specimens to look at, and then you could go and check and then upload the results that you found. And then visualizations could be created right in taxon works. You could do these for species, species groups, or genera, and they could include photos and drawings that you would upload that were associated with particular specimens or species. So I wanted to give a couple of examples. My postdoc has created some very lovely visuals for her group. She works on chloropids, and she has used lit to validate species within her group, but then she's put her second data source onto these beautiful um, haplotype networks. So here are terminalia, so that she can look at the, the both data sources in one figure. Here she included uh, habitus photos, pictures of the thorax and terminalia. And then here she even included some pictures of, of cetacean that she was looking at to work out these species complexes. So that's it. A big thank you to my co-authors and the various labs involved. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks very much, Emily, and thanks for uh, providing that thought experiment. Super useful. Um, I'm sure there's questions out there. What are they? Thank you, John. Emily, I'll, I'll maybe maybe uh, Rudolph is going to ask this question or address this, and if so, we can skip it. But um, getting those initial set of specimens from the malaise trap samples and into your Eppendorf's or whatever your first step was. Um, that's a lot of work still, right? I think Rudolph will touch on that somewhat, but um, could you just briefly say something about that process? Like we kind of went from malaise to like, I've got individuals. 
Yeah, so specimen handling is a huge issue, and um, I'm not sure how much Rudolph will be discussing it, but it's certainly a big topic uh, that we that we deal with at the museum um, in Berlin. Um, I mean, first, obviously, the specimens have to be barcoded, so they have to be moved into plates. And then the question is moving them from, from plates into vials, and then how do you store them? Um, Rudolph, do you want to comment on this, actually? Because I don't know how much you're going to cover in your talk, so I don't want to... Well, I'm going to make, talk about the automatic stuff, but uh, you can mention how much you can do in a day, right? I mean, you can easily uh, barcode a, spe a thousand specimens in a day. Uh -huh. So it sounds like a lot of work, but it actually is quite manageable. If you barcode a thousand specimens a day, uh, you'll be busy doing the morphology afterwards. So that's the, the least of your problems. Yeah, yeah so I, I did... I mean, at one point, I think I was actually doing up to 2,000 per day, and that that was kind of the easy part. The hard part then was dealing with the data set that I had created. Thanks. Uh, we have a question in chat from Brian. How do you evaluate if your sampling of specimens is sufficient? How robust is the PI analysis if sampling is biased? How do you evaluate if your sampling is well, I mean, that's a good question, but that's something that we have to deal with no matter no matter what we're doing. So if we're using one one source of data or multiple sources of data, so sampling of specimens, I mean, if you have a singleton, then it's certainly better to evaluate the singleton with multiple sources of data than just one. Plenty of people do taxonomic work with singletons or with very small data sets. So we did have some uh, very small clusters. Um, but again, they're validated with barcodes and with morphology, which I think is a better starting place than, than just using one or the other. So how robust is the PI analysis if, sam if sampling is biased? I, I mean, again, this is using multiple data sources is going to give you a better result, but you're going to have you're going to have problems with it, with any data set. So we had a number of singletons, even with 18,000 specimens barcoded, there were quite a few singletons. Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that answers that. I mean, there's only so much you can do. I could have, I could have kept going and I could have done 40,000. Actually, we did keep going. We now, we now have 34,000 specimens, um, that have been barcoded and that we're working with. So the paper was on the first 18, but even with 34,000, we have quite a few singletons. So the question, um, you know, it's, it's sort of a question of how, how much can you really do? And I think that that's where integrative taxonomy is so essential because, there is only so much you can do. Thanks, Brian. I have one other question. Like I, I, I sort of led with um, thinking about what the things are that we need to keep track of. And my, my question, Emily, is are containers one of those things? Like you take the specimen out and you put it somewhere and that's a container, a physical a physical wrapper around your specimen and that wrapper goes into something else and that goes into something else and that goes into the building and that goes into the Berlin Museum. Are you frustrated with physical container management in any way and is that an opportunity um, to improve upon in the sort of management software that that backs you up? I mean, I do think that this is one of the areas that that needs work. I think Rudolph will touch a little bit um, on ways to automate this and make this um, a lot more systematic and a lot easier to handle, hopefully in the long term. But I think that this is one of the areas that we're still going to have to make um, definite improvements in the future because as I mean, if one project is generating tens of thousands of specimens, then you very quickly are going to end up with hundreds of thousands and then millions of specimens. And the question is, yeah, how, how do you deal with those? So I think um, hopefully Rudolph will touch on that a little bit and answer that question a little bit. But I think there's going to be a lot of development in the next, you know, in the next, in the coming years. Thank you. Time for a quick, for a quick question. I, I have one. Debbie. Uh, um, from someone who doesn't do this work, but is interested in facilitating it as much as possible and understanding nuances. The singletons are fascinating to me, but they don't fall into any of the clusters. What happens to the singletons? What, what, how do we expose them or how can other people work on them? What, what's the path for the singletons? 
Uh, I mean, well, you can still you can still proceed with the singletons just as you would if you if you weren't using this system. I mean, you can you can still describe them. You have multiple pieces of information. So even though you don't have any other specimens to compare and validate, um, you can certainly go forth and, and describe them um, or identify them if you'd like. And you do have more information than if you if you only looked at morphology. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the choice is, is really up to the individual taxonomist if you want to move forward with, with putative species that you only have one specimen for. And that depends a lot on circumstances, too. You may sometimes make the choice that you want to go ahead and publish new species that are based on singletons, and other times you may want to hold off and, and wait for more specimens. So if I have, if I look at my 34,000 forids now and I have I have singletons in that data set, do I want to wait and do 50,000 or 70,000 and hope that I get more? Or do I want to simply proceed and say, well, it was a pretty large data set and it was a singleton and, and move forward. But I think that's an individual choice.